the physical law and personal agency. Our physical laws are a description, usually mathematical, of what normally happens under certain given conditions. This is surely obvious from the very first example that Hawking gives in his book, The Sun Rises in the East. But this law does not create the sun, nor the planet Earth with east and west. It is descriptive and predictive, but not creative. Similarly, Newton's laws of gravitation doesn't create gravity or the matter in which gravity acts. In fact, it doesn't even explain gravity as Newton himself realized. But it's even worse. The laws of physics cannot even cause anything to happen. Newton's celebrated laws of motion never caused a pool ball to race across the table. That can only be done by people using a pool cue in the action of their muscles. Suppose to make matters clearer, we replace the universe by a jet engine, and we are asked to explain it. Shall we account for it by mentioning the personal agency of its inventor, Sir Frank Whittle? Or shall we, following Hawking, dismiss personal agency and explain the jet engine by saying it arose naturally from physical law? Now this would be absurd. It is obvious we need both levels of explanation in order to give a complete description. It is also obvious that the scientific explanation neither conflicts nor competes with the agent explanation. They complement one another. It is the same with explanations of the universe. God does not conflict or compete with the laws of physics as an explanation. God is actually the ground of all explanation in the sense that he is the ultimate cause in the first place of there being a world for the laws of physics to describe. Now, there's more to this because the laws of physics can explain how the jet engine works, but not how it came to exist in the first place. Jet engine needed the intelligence and creative engineering work of Whittle. Indeed, come to think of it, the laws of physics plus Frank Whittle could not actually produce a jet engine on their own. There also needed to be some material subject to those laws that could be worked on by Whittle. Matter, ladies and gentlemen, may be humble stuff, but it is not produced by laws. I submit to you that the world of strict naturalism in which clever mathematical laws all by themselves bring the universe and life into existence is pure science fiction. Pure science fiction. Pure science fiction. Now, Hawking here echoes Peter Atkins, a colleague at Oxford, a well-known atheist, who believes that space-time generates its own dust in the process of its own self-assembly. Atkins dubs this the cosmic bootstrap principle, referring to the self-contradictory idea of a person lifting himself by pulling on his own boot laces. Philosopher of religion Keith Ward is surely right to say that Atkins' view of the universe is as blatantly self-contradictory as the name he gives to it pointing out that it is logically impossible for a cause to bring about some effect without already being in existence. Ward concludes, between the hypothesis of God and the hypothesis of a cosmic bootstrap, there's no competition, there's no competition, there's no competition. We were always right to think that persons or universes who seek to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps are forever doomed to failure. What perhaps all this goes to show is that nonsense remains nonsense even when talked by world famous scientists. By world famous scientists. So the only alternative is an unbodied mind, what theists call God, uh, an unbodied mind immaterial outside time and space. So there's a God. Then you have to say, but sorry, where did God come from? It's not a question I hear often answered. In order to recognize that an explanation is the best, you don't have to have an explanation of the explanation. In order to recognize that an explanation is the best, you don't have to be able to explain the explanation. Folks, this is an elementary point in the philosophy of science. 
Suppose astronauts were to find on the back side of the moon a pile of machinery there that had not been left by American or Russian cosmonauts. Uh, what would be the best explanation for that machinery? Well, clearly it would be some sort of extraterrestrial intelligence that had left the machinery there. And you don't have to have an explanation of who these extraterrestrials were or came from or how they got there or anything of that sort in order to recognize that the best explanation of this machinery is intelligent design. In order to recognize an explanation as the best, you don't have to have an explanation of the explanation. In fact, when you think about it, requiring that would immediately lead to an infinite regress of explanations. You would need an explanation of the explanation, but in order to recognize that as best, you need an explanation of the explanation of the explanation, and then an explanation of the explanation of the explanation of the explanation, and so that nothing could ever be explained. One of the outdated philosophical cliches, in my opinion, is that, well, who created God? We hear that all the time, and they think it's a baseball bat against the theists. But it's made of sponge. And let me tell you why. If we say, what caused the cause that caused the universe, then let's continue. What caused the cause that caused the cause that caused the universe? Let's continue. Then what caused the cause that caused the cause that caused the cause that caused the universe? Let's carry on. And that goes on and on and on backwards, but at one point, I have, I have to have an uncaused cause, or there would be nothing in existence today. Think of uh, a string of dominoes. You have a domino that knocks over a domino that knocks over a domino. I have to have a first domino, or that string of falling could never start. So in essence, to claim who created God and what caused the cause of the universe is the equivalent of saying that we don't have a universe. That we don't have a universe. Remember the premises of the argument I gave. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. Something cannot come into being out of nothing. But if something is eternal and timeless, then it doesn't fall under that first premise. It doesn't need a cause. And the concept of God is the concept of an eternal, self-existent, necessary being. And therefore, the answer is simply that God is uncaused. He is self-existent. Dear Dr. Craig, one of the objections which has been raised is the first law of thermodynamics, the rule that matter and energy can only be rearranged, or in other words, that matter is neither being created nor destroyed. Yeah. What's funny about this objection is that this is not an objection to the existence of God. This would be an objection to the Big Bang Theory of the origin of the universe. Mm. It would show that the Big Bang Theory of the origin of the universe is false, because according to that theory, all matter and energy, even space and time themselves, came into being at the moment of the Big Bang, and are therefore not eternal. They haven't mm. always been there in the past. So if these fellows were right, all contemporary cosmologists who believe in the Big Bang Theory of the origin of the universe would be contradicting the laws of thermodynamics, and that's hardly the case. Why? 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 Well, because the laws of thermodynamics, in particular the law of the conservation of matter and energy, only applies once the universe comes into being, it applies at every moment, uh, at every time, and every point in the universe. But it doesn't apply to the origin of the universe itself. And that's why cosmologists don't consider that the law of conservation of uh, energy and mass is violated by the Big Bang Theory of the origin of the universe. In fact, the uh, atheist fellow mentioned the laws of thermodynamics. He might have wanted to talk about the second law of thermodynamics, which says that in a closed system, uh, things tend toward increasing disorder. Now, the universe on the atheistic view is just a gigantic closed system because it is everything there is and there's nothing outside it. 
And what that implies is that given sufficient time, everything in the universe would grind down to a state of maximum disorder. So if the universe has existed for infinite time from eternity past, why is it that we don't find ourselves in this sort of thermodynamically disordered state? Uh, I think that the best answer to that is that the universe has not existed forever. It began a finite time ago in a low entropy condition, and the thermodynamic clock has been running ever since then. So the evidence of thermodynamics itself suggests that the universe and matter and energy are not infinite or eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning. To remind ourselves of the argument again, we have premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Premise two, the universe began to exist. And from that, we draw the conclusion that the universe had a cause. The universe had a cause. The universe had a cause. So we ask another question. What is the nature of this cause? And the nature of this cause upon conceptual analysis, which means critical thinking, thinking about this cause, we come to some startling conclusions. This cause must be one. The reason for this is because if we use the philosophical principle Occam's razor, which posits that we do not multiply entities beyond necessity, then we conclude it must be one. This cause must be uncaused, as we have already discussed the absurdity of an infinite regress of events, similarly with causes. This cause must be immaterial because it created the sum of all matter, which is the universe itself. Significantly, brothers, sisters and friends, this cause must be personal. The reason I'm saying this is how else can a, an eternal cause bring into an existence a finite effect, the universe that had a beginning in time. It must have chosen the universe to come into existence and choice indicates a will and a will indicates a personality. So, we have concluded the traditional view on God that a transcendental, immaterial, uncaused, eternal being exists. Being exists. Being exists. Some strange results have come up in about the last 20, 30 years, particularly in astronomy and also in quantum physics which suggests that the universe actually may have a purpose and some physicists are now suggesting it does have a purpose. And this has come out of some findings ab about the atomic, some of the fundamental numbers in atomic physics. During the past 40 years, scientists have determined the relative strengths of each of these primary laws and forces. These strengths are so critically balanced, they are often described as being finely tuned. These are numbers like the mass, the weight of an electron, the weight of a quark, the strength of gravity, the strength of the electromagnetic field. About 20 numbers that describe those and other parameters, features of our world, but nobody knows why it is that those numbers have the particular values that they do. Now, you could easily say, yeah, who really cares? You change the mass of the electron by a little bit more, a little bit less, does it really matter? And the answer is it does. See, it turns out that if you imagine that we had 20 dials right here, and we could fiddle with those 20 numbers at will, even a small change to the values of the known values of those numbers would cause the world as we know it to disappear. Because it turns out, and this is a very surprising, unexpected discovery, that the laws of physics, the basic given fabric of the world, had to be very specific, very finely tuned, as we sometimes say, for the possibility of carbon-based life appearing at all. For example, the strengths of the other forces are all important, the masses of the various subatomic particles. Now, this is one of a long list of properties in underlying physics that seem to be prerequisites for a universe with life. If all of these things were even a little bit different, uh, then life, uh, certainly life as we know it, could not exist. It's a very surprising uh, conclusion, uh, but it's, tr it's true and all scientists would acknowledge that's the case. Bernard Carr is a cosmologist and studies how the laws of physics operate in the universe. He says that the laws of nature are so finely tuned to enable complex life to exist. Muhammad is a messenger sent by God to give the Quran to mankind. 